Good evening. Okay. <laughs> I'm not able to see everything, but I'm trusting that it's time to move forward. So good evening and welcome back to our 40th, 47th annual Scholar and Feminist Conference entitled Living in Madness, Decolonization, Creation, Healing. Tonight's conversation, The Art of Madness, Cast Catastrophe, Memory, Desire, is the last in our five-part series. We are joined by three artists, Jess X. Snow, Mimi Cook, and M. Bazid, whose work confronts and explores grief and trauma and the possibility of healing in what might be referred to a time of general emergency. Sorry, what might be referred to as a time of general emergency. My name is Miriam Neptune. I am the Senior Associate Director at BCRW. For audio description, I am a brown-skinned femme with goldish locked hair, wearing a black jacket and satin blouse, sitting in a, an office at Barnard College. I want to acknowledge that Barnard College sits on the unceded lands of the Lenape people who continue to live in diaspora throughout the United States and Canada. I encourage you to learn more about how you can participate in land back movements. One of the motivations for planting, planning this conference is that we have witnessed how the catastrophic times we are living in impose a level of trauma that many of us are dealing with daily. As our panelists will talk about tonight, we are profoundly aware of the ongoing impact of COVID on our communities. This virus, which has exposed the cruelty of, an, of our inequitable structures, is still taking lives. Our hearts go out to all those who have been impacted by that loss, including recently a member of our BCRW family who we send to whom we send our love and care. We're also thinking about the many New Yorkers who are impacted by the yet unexplained violence earlier today in Sunset Park, Brooklyn. And we reject the use of this and other painful events as a justification for increased militarization and policing of our communities. You may feel impacted by these and other events tonight. You may also find that the topics covered tonight resonate in ways that are difficult. We will remind you throughout that there are many ways you can get support if you're overwhelmed, including talking to people in your community or network of care. We also wanna point you to the resources provided by the Fireweed Collective who hosted a beautiful emotional safety mapping workshop as part of this conference last week. We'll put that information in the chat. Today, I wanna thank all of the people whose labor and input served to make this conference possible, including the staff at BCRW, all of the staff, uh, Director Elizabeth Castelli, Avi Cummings, Hope Dechter, Sophie Kreitzberg, and Pam Phillips, our senior program assistant. Thanks to BCRW research assistant, Neelu Cooper for live tweeting and supporting Q&A tonight. Special thanks to our ASL interpreters from Coco Language Advocacy and Consulting, Crystal Butler and William Mendez Gallardo. Live captions are provided by Nicole Koki. Also, a huge thanks to our moderator tonight, Vani Natarajan, a poet and librarian who is a colleague here at Barnard College at the Barnard College Library and a candidate in the MFA writing program at Queens College. I will allow Vani to introduce themselves. Thank you, Vani. Thank you so much, Miriam. Um, and thank you everyone for joining us tonight. Um, my name is Vani Natarajan. I am a librarian at Barnard College and my pronouns are they and them. For audio description, I am a queer femme with brown skin, dark brown eyes, and black curly hair cut in a short bob. 
I wear black eyeliner on my eyelids and brown lipstick on my mouth. My torso is embraced by a long sleeve black leotard that kind of feels like a hug. And I'm also wearing a pink pinafore over that with a floral print. On my ears are earrings. I am sitting in a room with walls painted minty seafoam green next to a flowering cactus or once flowering cactus. Um, I am in the apartment I share with my partner in Lenape Hoking in the neighborhood known as Bedford Stuyvesant, Brooklyn, New York. Welcome to the BCRW panel, The Art of Madness, Catastrophe, Memory, Desire. I want to say a word on access to everyone who might be tuning in now or later in time and to each other as, as facilitator, interpreters, and co-panelists. I want to make sure that we can bring ourselves comfort and ease in our spaces. Let's please feel free to turn the camera off as we need to, to get up and move around, um, as, as we need to, to get snacks and hydration and um, to use the chat for participating as needed. Um, I was also want to give special thanks to our ASL interpreters, Crystal Butler and William Mendez Gallardo from Coco Language Advocacy and Consulting. And I'm really, really thrilled to be introducing our artist panelists tonight. Mimi Cook is a writer, scholar, teacher of things unwell, and editor of the collective hybrid book art project, Open in Emergency, which takes a decolonizing approach to mental health by asking what Asian American unwellness looks like and how to tend to that unwellness. The cards from this tarot deck, their artwork and the writing by Asian American artists are marvelous openings, reimaginings of archetypes, prompts that feel oracular and vast and are also rooted in time, place, history. I am excited for you to get to experience some of these tarot cards. Bazid is a multi-genre writer, editor, curator, and performer whose recent projects include a book-length erasure poem of Daniel Defoe's creative nonfiction account of London's bubonic plague. Their resulting book-length erasure, Plague Year Most Remarkable, carves out the language of that other, older archive into an extended anaphora poem a mor morologia in the face of capitalism's insistence on the discursive and practical relegation of certain bodies to disposability. I recently got to participate in a workshop that Bazid did on erasure poetry and their approaches to erasure totally rocked my world and showed me new ways to think with and against found texts. Writer, artist, and arts educator, Jess X. Snow, wrote and directed the film Little Sky, the story of a non-binary drag sensation who returns to their hometown to face their estranged father and the childhood memories that continue to haunt them. Jess Snow's art has been a really important presence in my life from the times I have gotten to hear them read poems at the Asian American Writers Workshop to getting to witness the beautiful murals they painted in Kingston, New York to the print of their art piece, A Daughter Migrates to Mother Earth that I have um, mounted in my apartment and spend a lot of time looking at. I'm gonna say a quick word on just the plan for tonight and what we're gonna talk about. So each of the panelists will be sharing from their work 
for about 15 to 20 minutes each. And then we'll have a conversation together um, with time at the end for audience questions. Some of the themes that um, I've been thinking about in the work of all three of these artists, Mimi, Bazid, and Jess, are relationships between image and text, grief and mourning, and what we inherit and how lineage can be experienced in different ways. Um, so I'm delighted to now hand it over to Mimi. Content warning, mentions of suicidal ideation and description. Dear Elia, sometimes I think of killing myself. I can remember two moments clearly, one lying in bed next to your tiny, always needing body, exhausted, sleep deprived for months, seeing no way out. There was no way out. Two, sitting on the edge of the bed as your father walked out of the room, out of my life, a disembowelment, my dreams of love, partnership, family, spilling out onto the floor from somewhere in my middle. I still have flashes, moments, when I imagine slicing my wrist, the acute burn of the cut, the relief of not feeling anymore. You have always kept me here. Resentfully so at first, and now a life preserver, an anchor, a mission. This thing called life is no fucking joke. The world is built on our backs, our wombs, our tears, but it was not made for us, and yet I claim it for us. Auntie Eliza writes, the Asian model minority is not doing well. I am not doing well. I'm writing you this letter because I need you to see the crisis that is Asian American life, the civilizing terror that is model minoritization, the neoliberal American dream, madness as the psychic life of living under siege. I'm writing you to tell you the lie of the thing called wellness. My child, the world makes us sick and then tells us it's our fault. Sickness as individual pathology, a lack of ability or will to achieve wellness. The world tells us what wellness looks like, marks it as normal, moral. Like whiteness, wellness is an ideal to strive for, a state of being in constant performance, invisibilized structures holding up bodies and persons, certain bodies and certain persons, invisibilized structures tearing apart other bodies other persons. Your worth is not tied to how well you can perform racialized capitalist productivity or gendered constructions of the self-made, martyring, sacrificing woman mother, or what Auntie Erin calls the debt-bound daughter, parental sacrifice exchanged for daughterly personhood. People are not to be measured by their usefulness, their ability to perform health, their proximity to racialized gendered ideals, their fulfillment of neoliberal dreams. I need you to understand that we are all differentially unwell, that people are vulnerable, made vulnerable, kept vulnerable, that our vulnerabilities are both our death and our life, that our vulnerabilities link us, connect us in a web of death and survival. This thing called life is no joke, my sweet child. It is okay to hurt. We must allow ourselves to hurt, to trace the losses, the heartbreak, the death. We must allow ourselves to be whole people in all our brokenness. Our lives, as always negotiating violence, trauma, crises of meaning. Our lives, as always finding new ways of making meaning, making community. I tell you this to free you, but to also show you how to allow others to be free. In your hands is a project I dreamed for me and for you, for the brokenness we all share, so different and so similar. I dreamed this project to save my own life, to help others save their own lives, to help you save yours. Open an emergency, my darling child. It's an emergency right now. 
Thank you. Um, my name is Mimi, and I'm really happy to be here. Uh, I am a Vietnamese American woman with very short black spiky hair. I'm wearing a um, pinkish tank top and a slouchy gray t-shirt over that. And behind me are some bookshelves uh, and some photographs. Thank you for including me in this really, really amazing session. And as part of this conference today to talk about uh, madness and art and what it, what it means to try to engage those two things together. Um, what I just read now is the opening letter or the editor's note to my project, Open an Emergency. Um, and as you could hear, the letter, the, the opening letter is to my daughter. Um, and the project that I created in originally in 2016 um, was an arts and humanities intervention into mental health to try to use new languages to figure out what hurts and how do we go in living while it hurts. Um, I felt like the ways we had been doing mental health uh, could not explain and could not capture the depth and the breadth of the experience of unwellness that I was experiencing, but also what I was seeing among my students, among uh, my family, among the larger Asian American community, larger queer community, and I felt like we have to have better language for this. We have to find better language for what it is that we're experiencing and how awful life can feel for us. Um, I wanted to move away from this idea of mental health as individual pathology, like an individual problem to be fixed, possibly medically, um, to thinking about mental health as embedded in the larger context of historical forces, cultural forces, structural forces, uh, and that happens collectively, right, to communities, not just individuals. And so how do we capture those experiences? And so I created Open Emergency with um, about 75 contributors, which I do not recommend anyone ever doing. <laughs> um, it was a lot of people to wrangle, uh, and, and but people gave amazing artwork and amazing um, interventions into forms of unwellness. So actually I'm gonna hold up the, the box right now. It's a box, it's actually not a book. Um, so what you're seeing on the screen right now is a white box with a red sticker on it that says in uh, letterpress, open an emergency. Um, and this is a publication with the Asian American Literary Review. And inside the box, you will find a couple different things. Um, I'm holding up the second edition right now because it sold out the first one and we made a second edition in 2019. Well, supposed to be 2019, but then pandemic happened and it got pushed longer and longer. So it came out in uh, late 2020. Um, one of the main components is a DSM. For those of you who don't know, the DSM stands for um, the Diagnostic Statistical Manual of Mental Disorders, which is the psychiatric Bible right, uh, created by the APA to catalog, catalog and um, explain mental illness and symptoms. And so we decided to make our own and call it the Asian American edition. Uh, but it's a hacked version, meaning like if the APA made an Asian American edition, it would be shit anyway. So we'd have to tear all the pages out and put in our own. And it's filled with um, work by non uh non-psychology psychiatry people for the most part um, and instead artists writers scholars in the humanities um, trying to grapple with how we can diagnose our own unwellness in our community and how we have already been imagining different ways of building care for ourselves um, the other element that i want to show is the asian american tarot deck so part of the project was creating i created my own tarot deck um, and I did that, and I'll hold up some cards in a minute. I'm holding a yellow box right now with teal text that says AALR and tarot in multiple directions. Um, and I'm happy to talk more about this um, uh, in the Q&A, but briefly, uh, I encountered tarot and, and saw it as a kind of meaning-making um, tool and process that was kind of amazing when I watched it in action in community. So what would it look like to have our own tarot cards um, drawn from Asian American experience, drawn from Asian American studies and Asian American knowledge? What would that look like and how could that be a better tool 
for engaging um, our unwellness and the forces that shape our experiences of wellness and unwellness. Um, so the tarot cards that come with this deck are renamed archetypes. I'm holding up a card now that says the refugee and the image is a watercolor image of uh, aerial view of a bunch of boats in water approaching land. Um, and there's a helicopter uh, and some other, I think there's a helicopter above and the, the land they're approaching has a wall or a fence. Um, so refugee does not exist in the regular tarot deck, right? But for Asian American experiences, it made sense to me to have a card that tries to capture the refugee experience. The difference between my tarot cards and other ones is also that we have text on the back. So I'm flipping over the card now and you're seeing a um, teal colored card with white text over it. And this particular card, the artwork was by artist um, Simi Kang, which is S-I-M-I-K-A-N-G. And the text is written by Mimi Tingyuan, M-I-M-I-T-H-I-N-G-U-Y-E-N, um, who is a scholar uh, who does ref refugee studies. And so Mimi and Simi work together on this card to render the image, but also to theorize what it means to think about refugees and to think about the refugee experience and what it means if you draw this card in a reading. How does that knowledge about and by refugees help us think about the forces that shape our lives when we pull this card in the reading? Because I really wanted to make cards that were usable as well, right? Not just art pieces, but meaning making tools that we can actually use for our own mental health. So I made this project originally in 2016, like I said. Um, people have had a lot of fun with the tarot cards since then. Uh, we did an expanded edition and we made a few more tarot cards in the expanded edition. And I wanna share one of those cards tonight. Um, I wanna share two cards tonight actually, but the first one I'm gonna share is the student, which is one of the cards that was in, is in the expanded pack of the tarot deck. No booster pack, sorry, but there's an expanded <laughs> deck. Um, and what's special about this card is that while all the other tarot cards in my deck um, have one single writer, this one is a collectively written card by students. Um, I felt it was really important to try to engage student experience, but it made no sense for me to write that card or really any professor or scholar to write a card about student life. Students have to tell us about their lives. Um, and so much of my work is about listening to students. But I also didn't want one particular student to have the burden of trying to explain all of student experience. So um, what I did was I started soliciting student work during a, my book tour, basically during visits to college campuses where I would meet students. I would ask them about their experiences. I would give them prompts to start kind of free writing about certain dimensions of their experience. Um, then I assembled a student editorial team to go through all of that and start crafting this card um, with, you know, with some guidelines. And then I and my partner, Lawrence Minbui Davis, that's L-A-W-R-E-N-C-E dash M-I-N-H B-U-I-D-A-V-I-S. Um, he's actually the co-founder and director of AALR. Um, he and I finalized the card. And so I'm going to share that with you today because it's collective. Uh, and, I, and I think that it captures certain things about the student experience that um, can teach us a lot. I learn a lot from students. So on the screen, you're seeing the front and the back of a tarot card. The front is in black and white. It says the number 29 at the top and the word the student at the bottom. The image is a black and white ink drawing um, with a figure of a student stooped at the bottom holding some bags. And then there's many, many other students kind of stacked on top holding various objects like an abacus, a laptop, um, a graduation cap, a book, and their arms waving in the air. On the right side of the card is the teal color again with the white text. And I'm gonna read this text out loud. The student is the 29th card in the major arcana, sometimes known as the lost card. The student cried the day of graduation. They play one role for the mother, another for schools, another as the daughter, another for workforces, another as the model minority, another for the state, always in the pull of the annihilating void. The student is, at essence, a note taker. Be grateful. 
always be okay. Chase the promise of this for hours. Never complain. Never be sick. Keep going. Nothing is ever enough. The work goes impossibly on. Is college life normal stress? What would it mean to leave? Strike that. We are finishing our parents' immigration stories, leaving behind the fact of living. We are not grades, a condition of what can't. Don't feel guilty. Strike that. Drawing the student card in a reading reminds you that student debt extends forward and backward across our collective lifetimes. But ask yourself, what is it you actually owe? Your entire personhood and then more. We gave you your past, now give us your future. The student urges us to refuse. If schools are a feeder system for churning out good citizens, embrace being a bad citizen. Embrace being a bad subject, a bad student, a bad child, a bad person, a revolutionary. Remember that the Asian American movement was birthed in the fires of student protest, written by students everywhere. And I want to add that the uh, fragments in the center set off by slashes that I read are uh, are quotes actually from student submissions, including the lines that were struck. Um, I found them very powerful because students wrote them and then struck them out. Um, and I thought that w- was generative for thinking about like what is allowed or what are we allowed to say and what are we not allowed to say or even think or even feel. And then the last thing I want to share is um, another tarot card called the Pandemic. And this card actually was collectively, also collectively created, but live time collectively created last year in May 2021 um, at an event that I hosted with the uh, UC Irvine Center for Medical Humanities. And so I I did an event where um, we had breakout groups, uh, do discussions, And from these discussions, uh, the facilitators would take notes on Google Docs. And then I, and again, Lawrence, my partner, um, would read these Google Docs and live time stitch together this card. I also don't recommend doing live editing. (laughs) Uh, It was very stressful, but also a really, really powerful experience um, that allowed folks there, I think, what came out of it was that it seemed like we had not had space to grieve and mourn 2020, right? Our experiences of being thrown into the pandemic and the conversations we had there were so powerful. And then the card we were able to collectively create, I think um, is a wonderful, not only snapshot um, in time of what we're experiencing, but an, an archive, right? An archive of feeling, an archive of grief, maybe even you can say in the language of this conference, an archive of madness. So I'll read this. Um, On the screen, you see a digital card. This card actually only exists digitally because we just created it recently. The the front of the image is in various shades of blue, the number 30 on top, the word the pandemic at the bottom. Um, It is a kind of brushwork art, including images of a Zoom screen, a person wearing a mask with their fist in the air, a person outside a window with their hand pressed against the window, a hospital bed, an iPad on the bed, a mask, some essential workers, both medical and I think maybe food, um, a casket, uh, and several people reaching out to the casket. On the right side of the card is the text, which I'll read. Um, And I'll be the last thing that uh, that I share. The pandemic is the 30th card in the major arcana. It has been a long year, like a long decade, one of atrophying time. We miss the way it feels to walk in a city in the current of everyone going everywhere. We don't remember why certain things felt important in the before times. Do remember seeing a classmate in a casket on YouTube live stream. The pandemic unmasks the lie of the word essential. Who provides care? Who deserves care? Death visited disproportionately on the poor, the black, the brown, the lower caste. Returning to normal is an impossibility brimming with longing and terror. In the center of the card is a discarded mask, an iPad by a hospital bed. Say our goodbyes however we can. Toilet paper has become a totem of survival, sweatpants, an emblem of refusal, sourdough, a gift of renewal. All things will pass like a kidney stone. 
When will we hold our brother's hand again? Will our kids remember this as the worst time of their lives or as something strange and tender? Will our dogs forgive us when we return to work? Drawing the pandemic card in a reading means a portal is opening. Where it leads is unclear, but remember, people have always slept in doorways, huddled under them during bombings. Who knows if the pandemic will ever end? A collective card. Thank you so much. Um, Mimi, thank you for that. And actually, I um, feel like it's an auspicious beginning, um, I guess, to, to get the pandemic card as a start to my talking about this project. Um, thank you for giving us so much to think about. Okay, so um, my name is Bazid. I am sitting in somebody else's bedroom that has a Visit Palestine poster on the column, and I agree. Um, I am wearing bright green glasses and a button down shirt uh, that's navy blue and has these like white diamonds that are made of flowers on it. Um, I'm here to talk about a, a project I'm calling um, Plague Year Most Remarkable. Um, it's a book length erasure poem and to just explain very quickly, um, what an erasure poem is. It's a found poem in that it is using text that already exists and it is taking away text somehow from it, blacking out, whiting out, obscuring text um, in order to leave behind a new work. Um, and I thought about this project for, for many different reasons. Like many of you, I was experiencing the um, I, I wrote it down from the tarot card, the long year of atrophying time um, and the feeling of just like Groundhog Day over and over and over and over again. <laughs> um, at the time, I was also um, researching something about ancient Egyptian culture that led me to this idea that um, I'm Egyptian, by the way, <laughs> um, and I was I was reading about ancient Egyptian culture and conceptions of time, and um, they had a concept of time where there's capital T time um, and lowercase t time. Lowercase t time is like I knock my cup over, water spills. Capital T time happens in loops and happens to all of us. As, as humanity. Um, and so there's this idea of like repetition. Um, so I was, I was feeling that very much. I was not doing very well at the beginning of the pandemic. Um, the first three months were very, very difficult for me. Um, and I didn't really know what to do with all the extra space in my head. That was just like, that was, that was just being channeled into anxiety of all different kinds. Um, and I heard about the um, narrative nonfiction account uh, that Daniel Defoe wrote of the bubonic plague, um, which he'd assembled from other people's accounts because he was he was very young, I think, or not yet alive. Um, and most of them based on journals from his uncle. And it's written sort of in the same style. There's an unnamed narrator who's just telling you about what's going on. And there were things formally even about that work that were kind of doing this durational thing that was interesting. Like the whole book is written in one long paragraph. There are, there are no chapter breaks, you don't get a break. It's just like, we're still in the plague, we're still doing this, we're still doing that. Um, and so I was thinking about that and um, in the idea, this idea of like a cosmic loop that we were in also felt very real as I kept, uh, I was listening to the book on audio tape first, as I kept listening, there were so many things that were common to the experience and they are hundreds of years apart. There's so much more technology. There's all this connection. There's all these reasons <laughs> why you would not expect a global pandemic to sort of have the same exact flow chart and, and so many of the same events happen. So that was a, a strange thing to be thinking about. And just to give a few examples of, of what that was, um, the, uh, the government like fuckery lying about even the, the fact that it was happening, that happened. 
um, th the um, misinformation and charlatanry from like all sorts of actors. Um, the exceptions that wealth could buy uh, acted very much the same. Um, the six feet thing, which that was like, blew my mind a little bit because the diseases are different. One is communicable through, you know, like that, air, like air and breath and whatever. And the bubonic plague was through like fleas infesting the rats or something. Um, and yet the six feet thing was exactly the same. Um, and the increase in sort of like public erratic behavior, um, but just public examples of people like really suffering mental breakdowns as a result of everything changing around them and there not being a um, appropriate public health response that could actually support people through all of that. Um, and another thing um, that was a little disheartening too <laughs> was um, in one form or another, like this narrative of somehow like people deserving the death that, that they were experiencing or the illness that they were experiencing, right? So like back then maybe it, it was more termed of like, God is angry at us, right? Um, in, in, in this, in the contemporary example, it was a lot of like, well, this is our due because of our um, animal husbandry practices, which makes these kinds of diseases more communicable. All of this like, uh, oh, uh, we, we deserve death because we are vaccine deniers. We deserve death because we are, the, right? Like nobody is saying we deserve, <laughs> but there's a lot of people who are getting blamed um, for their own catastrophes about something that is an external force acting upon all of us. Um, and I'm, I'm not saying any of this to like discount personal responsibility um, uh, to the collective, um, but just that it was interesting that like, as soon as something really, really bad was happening, sort of the like logic kicked in and like needed to like find find logic and find a reason for why this was appropriate that this was happening to us. Um, and so if I can, um, if I can ask for the, one of the images to be pulled up, thank you. So this is what my text looked like after I was done. Um, the book was 222 pages. <laughs> um, so this took a very long time. Some of the things formally um, that I decided on um, was because I wanted to be accessing the archive in this way, kind of making commentary on how much was unchanged. I decided that I, um, I did reset this text ultimately, but I couldn't change the order of any words. I couldn't break them apart. Like, um, I definitely no insertions of my own. Um, and I also decided for my experience <laughs> uh, to use pen instead of marker. So you'll see there's like thousands of, of pen strokes. I probably, I don't know how these things scale, but this took hundreds of hours to do um, at a time when I had hundreds of hours. And it was actually like pretty calming, I think, for my brain to sit and just do this in the sunlight in <laughs> New Mexico, which is where most of it happened. Um, I also decided to use the header, the plague, um, from the top of every page. Um, and for, for, for a couple of reasons, first sort of the idea of the repetition being its own kind of insistence on witness at a time when, because we, the economy, because the economy, everybody was being encouraged to like relax conditions that meant that people in, in the margins who had health concerns for whatever reasons were just not going to, to not be as safe or not going to be as protected. And that didn't matter because of the economy. Um, and so the idea of just like, no, it's actually happening. It's still happening, still happening, still happening. Um, it was, was part of the reason for that. And then the idea of like moralogia, I don't even know if I'm pronouncing that word right. I should figure that out if I'm going to put it in descriptions. Um, 
But um, I watched a lot of those videos and it's a morning practice that's native to like my people. <laughs> um, and I watched a lot of videos from other cultures and there is definitely this insistence on like repetition. There's a lot of like long sounds. And I think a lot of it is a way of just helping people cry and breathe through crying is, is my impression from what a lot of it sounds like. There's these like just long howling sounds um, that are common to a lot of them. So um the 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 idea of an anaphora poem which is a poem where the first few sounds or words or whatever um are repeated helped for for that where i was like okay so it does it does these couple of things um let me see if there's anything else that i wanted to mention oh just to describe the page we're looking at so um the visual content is um it is an iphone capture of page 32 um, of the book and um, everything is scratched out with a black pen. It's really difficult to read the, the what's underneath. Um, and the words that are left behind are uh, in red squares that also have some traces of pencil um, from when I was like sketching what the page was going to be before I was sure. Um, cause I also couldn't start over. That was another thing. Like once the mark was done on the page, um, that was it. Like that was the page. That was the poem that I was working with. Um, and there's only one copy <laughs> of this. I have not digitized it. I'm really hoping no disasters happen. Um, like spilled cups, etc. Um, and the, the words left over on the page say, the plague, the most grievous story must be told. And then in another page, if we could just switch to the next slide. Thank you. Um, I can't tell the page number on that one. Oh, page 27. Um, it says, uh, sorry. <laughs> um, it says the plague a snare laid for the poor. Um, and now I'm going to just read a few pages from, um, from my, my erasure of it. Um, I wish I had thought to, to add the PDF as, a, um, uh, as one of the, like these visual things uh, to look at because I did reset the text. Um, here we go. The plague year most remarkable, the great visitation written by a citizen who continued all the while. The plague was returned again. It mattered not from whence it came, all agreed it was come. But all was kept very private. The plague returned them to mortality. The people showed a great concern at this, began to be alarmed. This turned the people's eyes, this possessed the heads of people very much. The plague, from four to six to eight, the usual number of burials successively increasing to, to, to a higher number. The plague again, the danger as good as beginning. Above named apprehensions were among the people returned again, stock market fever, infected houses already infected. This was the beginning. The plague, families lay all sick together. Teeth began to swell. The weight of funerals. The plague continued free yet on that side of the water. The richer sort thronged out of town with their servants attending them loaded with baggage. Passes and certificates of health for such as these to pass through the towns upon the road to lodge in any inn. The plague. The government. Rumors. 
in the imagination. Merchants, a family of servants kept at business, warehouses filled with goods, overseer fit to hazard the loss of all in the world. Master, save thyself. The plague, trust God with your life. As many did, those armies in the war, the plague, great damage, ruin intended, disappointments from heaven. The plague, his eye upon the particular intimations from heaven of his unquestioned duty, visited. It came very warmly, the will of heaven. God preserved death and danger to be divine. It was a kind of flying. His justice turned resolution again, inclined to lot. God laughed, told several stories of foolhardy people, as he called them, disabled by distempers or disease, his providence. Go out of town, hire a horse, ridiculous. Health and limbs travel. The plague proceeded to tell mischievous predestinating notions of every man's end being predetermined, unalterably beforehand decreed. Go unconcerned into infected places, converse with infected persons, die. Upon these arguments, the infection increased. The plague went home that evening, greatly oppressed, irresolute, not knowing what to do. Apart and all alone? For already people had, by a general consent, taken up the custom of not going out. And supported with a secret satisfaction, more than ordinarily serious, cried out, Well, I know not what to do, Lord. Direct me. Casting eye on verse read on as follows. I will say of the Lord, he is my refuge and my fortress. My God in him will I trust. Surely he shall deliver thee from the snare of the fowler and from the noisome pestilence. He shall cover thee with his feathers. His wings shalt thou trust. Thou shalt not be afraid for the terror by night nor for the arrow that flieth by day, nor for the pestilence that walketh in darkness, nor for the destruction that wasteth at noonday. A thousand shall fall at thy side, and ten thousand at thy right hand, but it shall not come nigh thee. Only with thine eyes shalt thou behold and see the reward of the wicked. Because thou hast made the Lord refuge, the most high thy habitation. Thank you very much. Hi, hi everyone. Um, my name is Jess X. Snow. I am wearing, uh, I'm a non-binary 
um, Asian person with a dark background behind me, um, currently on the unceded lands of the Lenape people or in um, Brooklyn, New York. And I'm wearing a indigo jacket with dragons on it. Um, I'm, really, I'm really honored to be here. And today I'm going to be screening my film, Little Sky. And, um, and it was a film that I created in collaboration with, with um, a lot of queer, queer Asian community members in New York City featuring original music and, and, um, and like original costume designs. And it's based on a story about, about my own um, healing journey from childhood domestic violence from my father and the the film um, is also inspired by um, by my friend Wo Chan who is a queer um, Chinese American drag performer and and um, they helped me develop the character of Sky who is the main character in this film and and as I was making this film I wanted to to um, um, combine um, childhood memories with the present day to kind of create a story about how healing is not linear and 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 how in in times of um, uh, violence and PTSD and trauma um, we can turn to to the units of kinship that we build with our chosen family and and community to transcend these histories of violence and hopefully create a um a more safer and loving world in in the future and yeah and i'll i'll screen the film and then i'll talk a little bit about it um after it screens so um thank you thank you so, so much for having me Chai 
My name is Sky. Thanks for coming. You know, I haven't been back here since uh, my mom and I moved away when I was a little kid. But I wrote a song about my family. Hope you all like it. Forgive me, Father, for I have failed the body you gave. Um, sorry, I think we're dealing with some technical difficulties. I think we're going to restart it from that point. So <laughs> thank you for your patience. Okay, so I think it's taking a little bit longer to um, to get the film back. So sorry. Um, so I'm I'm just gonna talk a little bit about the the process of making the film and and a, just some reflections about like on um, what it's like now looking back at the the process. So um, the film was was created pre pandemic in in the fall of 2019 and early 2020 and um and it it kind of just started as a as like this rough idea that i had inspired when when i like finally confronted my dad about the um like the the ways that he was violent toward me and my mom growing up and and then like and there was the song that we used to sing um to each other as a family that was a it was a chinese song and and that's um, the same song that is featured in the film later, and um, and I think I just wanted to make a film that is that honors the complexity of 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 what it means to confront trauma in the family because I think for a really long time, I um, like I I felt like the way that I understood trauma was that like. Um, 
someone um, can just like commit some commit like a violent act and that's kind of just like who they are and it, and I realized later after I healed that it was a very binary way of looking at at trauma and and my understanding of it now is that like um people are capable people who are hurt are capable of hurting deeply but are also capable of loving deeply which is kind of what makes it um really really hard to heal specifically from complex PTSD and and I realized that it's like okay to both to both um feel feel sad and hurt by by what someone did but at the same time also feel feel like a longing for like the the unit of family that I never had even if if my only understanding of of a unit a family is, is one that is riddled with experiences of both both love and and violence and i think ultimately i was able to reach a place of acceptance not necessarily forgiveness but ac acceptance about about um my family and the people who i've who in my life i felt hurt me and i think this film helped a little bit in in the process of that but but i will be completely honest that in order to make this film it was also like re-traumatizing sometimes as well but i'm really grateful for the the community that i had around me and everybody who showed up for the film who believed in me and my process in in the creation of this film and everybody who poured their their heart out into it because and i think looking back at it now i feel like the process of filmmaking is a way to reprocess trauma and, and um um, and also reach a place of healing um, with with my own agency, and and I think that has um, helped me um, a lot as an artist. But I but I also want to acknowledge that it, it is really really hard to make work that is personal and about personal experiences of grief and and trauma and and um, and I think I learned a lot in. The process, but I also feel like there's a big part of me that also just wants to make film about friendship and about love, and about just like our relationship with with lands and like where we come from, um, in 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 more loving and simple ways as well. So, um, and yeah, so I, I hope as I. Um, I'm not sure if the film has loaded yet, but but I I feel like that's what I would have to say now about the film. So now you can you, you can watch the rest of the film. <laughs> Thank you. Um, yeah, yeah, can you hold this? I just need to find my phone yeah, one yeah, second. Thank totally. you so much. Um, I'm Mia, by the way. I'm also a musician, not so much like performer, but a veteran singer songwriter. Um, I just wanted to say thank you so much for performing tonight. I just, it meant so much to me. That's really, really sweet. Thank you. <laughs> Oh, is this the photo that you're carrying? Oh my god! <laughs> 
<laughs> my mom used to take me here all the time after Japanese school. Do you know this place? Why don't you move out of New York anywhere? My mom and I just really hated living here, so we had to leave. I'm actually thinking about moving to LA. Mm -hmm. I just feel like there's not a whole community here. Out there, there's like a whole community of Asian American careers. Like my friends starting at the Asians Club. Like we don't have that here. I don't think I'm gonna find it. Close your eyes. Take a deep breath. The world is full of beautiful, magical queers. And you and I are just two of them. Okay. What's wrong? I think I don't remember everything you do to them. to the studio. I'm sickly.
There is no use in polarities or opposites, cause I've found my truth between boy and me. I'm sharing my skin. I've lost a war and won my life, but my blood's a mirror to the darkest sky. The shedding of skin. No one sees our life, we'll still see each other. We'll still see each other. Um, thank you so much for watching the film. I think I've said everything that I want to say about it. So I don't really have much more to say, but if you have any questions, you can ask later in the Q&A. Thank you. Wow. Um, I'm so moved and ah, I feel so full after getting to experience all of your art. So thank you so, so much, um, so much, Jess Vazid and Mimi. Um, so I'd love for this part to be a conversation, which means, I mean, certainly I have questions that I want to ask, but I also want to like really invite you to be in conversation with each other, like in experiencing each other's work, if questions came up or if certain moments really resonated with you, I, I just like really want to invite you to like talk about those things um, because I see so much resonance between your work. So I feel like it's just so exciting to have, um, to be able to, share the space with you and to talk about, yeah, what we're experiencing. I guess I can, st I, I'll, maybe, I guess I'll start us off with something that, um, that I noticed because I was going, I was going to ask a question about grief and mourning. And then there was this moment where Bazid, you were talking about the concept of morologia, and you were talking about repetition, breathing through crying, um, and it made me think about repetition and circularity and how that feels connected to grief. 
Um, and then I was thinking about Mimi, what you had said about just, just the really urgent need to have a space to grieve and to feel. And I think specifically this came up in the pandemic card. And then, um, and then Jess, I remember when you were talking about your process around the film, and I love this, what you said about healing is not linear. Um, and I feel like there's something about in all of also the forms that you're working in and the way that you bring out repetition in your work that feels so powerful. So I guess if there's a question, just kind of grief and how, um, how you feel it connected to your process and to, and to the works that you shared. And um, if you wanna talk about repetition too, maybe open up a space to talk about the relationship between repetition and grief. And uh, sorry, this feels like three questions in one. So <laughs> close it out there, yeah. One thing that I wanted to say real quick about repetition is that like I was so I had I had seen um, open in uh, in um, emergency before, but I don't think I'd like um, I hadn't looked into the contents like I sort of knew about the project um, and that I love that we're now part of the repetition because like we're in the archetypes and like figuring out how like by this insertion into the tarot deck of like the student or the pandemic or something um and i just love like doing that rather than having all these like queens and wizards and i don't know what but just like the 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 people who we are and the the things that we're feeling and and for that being like actually a way through something um and and I think about like how many people have this deck at home, how many people might be holding that card. I know the pandemic card is digital, but I just wanted to say that, that I feel good being part of like, if there's now a repetition that includes like this experience too. This is Mimi speaking. Busy. thank you so much for that. Um, that. Your comment makes me think about form. Like I approach the tarot cards, right? As a, as a form, um, that breaks a genre. I mean, it, it doesn't, it's not a genre that exists. It's mm -hmm. a fake genre I made up, right? So uh, it, what happens when you create form that allows for different kinds of engagement, new kinds of engagement? And so I'm actually seeing that across all of our works, right? That the forms we're choosing um, are very intentional shapes for exploring these issues, issues of grief, issues of pain, um, that clearly require us to find new forms for expressing it. And so I love the forms that we've chosen and, and the different kind of dimensions or aspects we capture through the mm -hmm. ways that we've shaped the, the, the projects that we're doing. Did, was there a reason, Mimi, that you were interested in like a future telling form, like something that sort of has the like internal site, like tarot or? That, no, that's a great question. Um, so I knew nothing about tarot before I made the tarot deck. It's like, a, that's my confession. Um, I encountered a friend. Uh, his name is Long Bui, L-O-N-G-B-U-I. Uh, he's a colleague in Asian American Studies and a friend. And he was giving tarot readings at an academic conference, like in the downtime, right? Because tarot cannot exist in the scholarly context, apparently. It only exists during happy hour when we're all drinking after the sessions at a conference, right? Um, and I was watching him give tarot readings and it was uncanny and amazing and fun. Um, lots of joking, lots of laughing, lots of like, whoa, that was kind of, you know, deep or that was like an amazing moment. Lots of connection, storytelling. And my, my training actually is in religious studies. Um, and so I saw that moment. I was like, oh, my God, this is like meaning making happening right in front of me through a form that I didn't know existed before. Um, and look how powerful it can be. Then I said, oh wait, how much more powerful if we actually created our own and not just used, um, an, a, the tarot deck traditionally is an Italian medieval playing deck. Um, it was not actually divination. Its original for, use was just like, like our 52 card playing cards, um, then became adopted into divination practices. And so that feels like, you know, 
maybe not the best source for thinking about our particular experiences, um, can we draw on other kinds of knowledge, right, to, to do that? And so uh, I felt like the fortune telling divination process of it um, was an amazing component that we could adapt to, uh, to think about mental health, which I don't think we normally do, or at least when I was making the deck, people were like, what the fuck does a tarot deck have to do with mental health, right? I actually think people find that question much, like, find that connection much clearer now because tarot is having such a resurgence um, across so many communities, especially like queer of color communities. But when I was making it, not even that long ago, I feel like people were like, mm, I don't get it. Um, but I felt like, why not? Like, of course, fortune telling should be a way of making sense of our lives and making sense of pain in that process. Thank you for asking that. Oh, this is me, Megan. Can I also say just that, like, I wanted to cry. I, I, I wept, okay, during <laughs> during parts of the film. Um, it was it was incredibly powerful, and I also know Wo personally, and and uh, I just feel so amazed by um, the narrative you created, but also what felt like for me very um, a kind of vulnerability and emotional honesty. I think in part because like you were saying your process that you worked with Woe um, to kind of collaborate on this character. And it felt like, like I was seeing the character, but also Woe <laughs> and also like a kind of transcendent pain um, through that, that, that was really powerful. So thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you for inviting me to be a part of this and, and letting me share this film that was created with so many community members. I'm glad to know that you know Wo personally and you can see a part of Wo's soul in the performance because I, I really feel like um we're Sky has a part of both of us in, inside of them. So yeah. Okay, like not to get competitive, but I also know Wo. So oh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> no, and actually I was gonna say this a little bit, but I was like I felt corny. Let's all say hi to Wo. Hi Wo, we love you. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. We love you, Wo. Yeah. Um I was thinking this a little bit coming into the room because I think like Mimi, Lawrence and I were in a room like thousands of years ago for the publication of something that would like it. I think it, it was even like maybe just renting the space from them and then seeing Jess's film and seeing Woe in it and just already feeling like sort of we're already making this work in the community we want to be talking to and that we actually spend time to, with and um so there's a warm feeling about that. Um, and I, I wanted to say about the, just about your film, just there, that one line, um, they're going to remember everything you do. <laughs> like, just incredible. And, and, and speaking of like the role of, of repetition and cycles and trauma and all of that, like just that one line and its simplicity and its future telling sort of like in this, like, yes, I love that moment. So thank you. I'm so glad you liked that moment. I almost didn't know whether I needed to keep that line or not, but I decided to keep it. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Thank you. This is Mimi speaking. Uh, Jess, can I ask you why you were like considering not keeping it? Just like I don't know. I just went through like 25 different cuts of this film. It was like a different film in the script and a different film we shot and a different film that we edited. Wow. But then eventually we found the, it was written as a linear film, but then in the editing process, we found that it would be much more effective as a non-linear film where we get to see Sky go back in time and, and like kind of like, um, only be able to remember these repressed memories when they see the the father and and then kind of like piece to, together all of these things toward the, the end and I think I um in the editing process there were many points where I was like is this too much dialogue could this be communicated through just the silence and the performance instead but but then I, I realized that there needed to be like some some like context so then I brought back like that line yeah I love that line so much too. And I also just wanted to say, I really loved um, the way that um, the kind of 
blossoming of this friendship was was portrayed in the film too, and that finding of of what felt like yeah, like chosen family between Sky and Neil, and like um, I was really curious about. And I guess maybe this kind of connects to a larger question that, um, yeah, relates to, to all of your work, but um, the way the way that the photograph appeared, I just found so moving. Um, the way that this photograph, the Polaroid photograph from um, from the restaurant was like both this like kind of documented like family of origin and also led to this like connection this new connection um yeah and I just um I just was curious about that and maybe if there's a larger question too about just like finding like bringing in like older um kind of documents or older texts or sources into your work um I feel like that's something that I'm seeing a lot in all of your work I think we're oh, I'm so sorry. There's no cat action, so the tension is. <laughs> should we? Should we? Okay, we're going over five. Um. I'm, okay, I'm so sorry. Should I, is this a moment where I should actually open it up to questions from the audience? I'm so sorry. Yeah, let's also see if there's any questions. Yeah. Um, yeah, questions from the chat. So feel free to add questions to the chat. And I'm sorry that I like lost track of time. Um, I, there's just so much to talk about with all this amazing work, um, all this amazing art. I'm seeing a lot of love in the chat, which is really great. Um, but yes, to answer the most recent question, are the guests open for questions from the from the chat? Yes, we are. Yes. In yes. the last couple of minutes. Yes. Yeah. Well, until a question comes in, I'll say <laughs> I'll say about um, also about Jess's film that I love that the sort of like the redemption at the end of the film didn't need to come from the oppressor, didn't need to come from like the source of the hurt, and could come from this completely external um, source that was just like out there in the world and so ser serendipitously found. So I I like that a lot. Yeah. Thank you so much, and also um, thank you, Bonnie, for pointing out the connection about the the photo. Um, yeah. Thank you, and I'm seeing I'm seeing a question in the chat actually, which is how can we follow all of you? Very important question, actually. Um, I think maybe that could open up to like social media and other ways. But. Um, so I'm currently, I de deactivated my social media <laughs> and I'm planning to deactivate it for as long as I can, but I might go on later this year, but you can find my work on my website at justxsnow.com and I have a mailing list you can subscribe and I will begin to use it soon. So thank you. Uh, this is Mimi. I, like Jess, do not have much of a public social media presence, and even though I feel like I should. Um, but you can find my work on my website as well, which is my name, uh, Mimi Cook, M-I-M-I-K-H-U-C dot com. Um, and I actually probably will be doing some kind of newsletter at some point, too, like Jess. Um, I do want to point out, uh, I'll let Bazid speak in a second, sorry. I, I want to point out that there's another question about asking Jess about um have you been able to show the film more widely? So I want to get back to that after Zid shares their their following. Uh, sure. I, I started a website in 2018, and that's the end of that story. It doesn't exist. <laughs> um, I am at, at Putteraholic 
um, on what on Instagram, putter a holic like if when you putter around the house doing things, putter a holic. And Jess, I am seeing a question for you, um, asking if you have a chance to show your film widely, and if so, what kind of response from specifically the Asian American community? I saw the little circle of death a little earlier, so I'm a little worried Jess might have some technical difficulties as well. Okay. Um, I'm so sad that we are, we seem to be running out of time. And so I might need to, to wrap up in this moment, but I hope that this is an opening for more connections and conversations. I just want to thank everyone so much. Thank you so much, Mimi. Thank you so much, Bazid. And thank you so much, Jess, um, for sharing your art with us and, and sharing so um, generously about your process and about what moves you and for giving us the space. Um, and also um, so much gratitude to our wonderful ASL interpreters, Crystal Butler and William Mendez Gallardo from Book of Language Advocacy and Consulting. And I also just wanted to um, extend huge, huge thank yous to Miriam, Avi, Sophie, and Hope from BCRW. Yes, thank you, Vani, for your beautiful moderation um, and setting the the table for all of our guests to share. Um, thank you, Bazid, Mimi, and Jess for these very moving projects. Um, thank you for reminding us that creative and cultural work is a tool of resistance to erasure and insistence on our right to survive and speak about the truth of our experiences, um, our madness, our subjectivities. Um, and how we persist through these catastrophes, this moment of catastrophe, um, and hopefully make sense of it or, or don't. <laughs> um, thank you to everyone who has joined us tonight. We appreciate you supporting um, BCRW and the work of these artists. And thank you. Good night. Thanks, everybody. Good night.